This video covers section 3.3, which covers arc length and curvature for vector valued functions. Now, we started our discussion of calculus with vector valued functions in 3.1 with limits, and then we continued it in the last section by taking a look at derivatives and integrals. What we want to do now is look at some applications of the derivatives and integrals by taking a look at arc length. If we think about a particle that's moving through three-dimensional space, we can describe the path it takes as the distance that it's traveling. We can calculate the distance that it travels along this nonlinear path by calculating the arc length. And this is very much related to the arc length of a parameterized equation that you studied in Calculus 2. The other application we're going to study is what's called curvature. And curvature is a measure of, well, how curvy that path is. So the tighter it is, the sharper the curve, then the curvature value increases. And if it is more linear, it decreases. These are both applications that can be applied to the real world. For example, if you're building a road, it's very important to know about the curvature of a turn in the road so that the car can maintain its own lane. We're also going to take a look at a couple of new unit vectors, namely the binormal vector and the normal vector. We've already talked about the unit tangent vector, which is basically in the direction of the tangent vector, which if the vector valued function represents position of a motion of a particle in time, then the tangent, which is the derivative of the velocity vector function, that becomes the velocity. So if we take a unit vector in that direction, we call it the unit tangent. We're also going to look at the normal and binormal vectors, which are also unit vectors. And together with the tangent vector, these three vectors are all orthogonal to each other. So they create a sort of 3D coordinate system, but centered at the point where the particle is at a particular point in time. This is called the Frenet frame of reference, or the TNB framework for short. And we'll take a look at how to implement this in Calcplot 3D. Our learning objectives are pretty straightforward. We want to determine the length of a particle's path in space by using the arc length function for a vector value function. We want to explain the meaning of the curvature of a curve in space and state its formula and calculate it. We also want to describe the meaning of the normal and binormal vectors of a curve in space. And along with the tangent vector, the unit tangent vector, it will describe a framework called the Frenet framework or the TNB framework. Let me share my screen with you and we'll get started. We're going to start with the arc length formula for a parametric equation. You studied this in calculus two when you had a parameterized equation, x is a function of t and y is a function of t, which does sound a lot like a vector valued function. A vector valued function takes these functions of t and represents them as the components of a vector valued function. When we were in calculus two, we could compute the arc length of a curve L between the parameter t equal a and t equal b by squaring the derivative of x with respect to t and the derivative of y with respect to t and adding them together, then taking the square root of the sum and calculating the integral. This gives us a way of doing the same thing, but for a vector valued function. The formula is pretty much the same. Let's take a look at the formula for a vector valued function. Let's suppose we have a smooth curve. And again, we define a smooth curve by saying that the derivative of it is not the zero vector, right? And that the vector valued function is continuous, which means that it exists at the point, the two-sided limit exists, 
and they're equal to each other. So it has to be continuous and the derivative cannot be zero. All right, the zero vector. When we have a smooth curve, so no pointy or jagged parts, and our vector valued function is given by f as a function of t in the i hat direction, g as a function of t in the j hat direction, and h as a function of t in the k hat direction, where the parameter varies between a and b, then we can say that the arc length of that curve, that smooth curve over the interval from a to b of the vector valued function is essentially the integral from a to b of the square root of each individual component of the vector valued function's derivative squared. So that means f prime of t quantity squared plus g prime of t quantity squared plus h prime of t quantity squared, all added together and take the square root. But this should remind you of something. Remember, our vector valued function is given by the components f, g, and h. And we've already said in previous videos that the derivative r prime of t is the derivative of f, the derivative of g, and the derivative of h. And to find the magnitude of that derivative, we would square each derivative add them together, and then take the square root. But that's the formula we have here for arc length, which means that we can actually represent this formula as the integral where the parameter t varies from a to b of the magnitude of the derivative of the vector valued function with respect to t. And this gives us a shorthand way of doing it. So let's go ahead and take a look now at an example. In example one, we are given a vector valued function in three dimensional space. The i hat component is two times t squared plus one. The j hat component is two t squared minus one. And the k hat component is t cubed. The parameter t will vary between t equals to zero and t equal three. Now what we want to do is find the arc length along that section of the path of the particle. So the first thing we're going to do is simply compute r prime. So when we do r prime, we take the derivative of each component individually which gives me 4t comma 4t comma 3t squared. The next thing I want to do is find the magnitude of that, and then I will do the integration. So to find the magnitude of it, all I need to do is square each piece, add them together, and take the square root of the sum. So this becomes the square root of 4t squared twice plus the square of 3t squared. And this would give me 16t squared plus 16t squared plus 9t to the fourth, which I can simplify as 32t squared plus 9t to the fourth. Now, there is a common factor underneath the radical, which is t squared. I can factor the t squared off of the radical, and this will give me the square root of t squared times the square root of 32 plus 9t squared, still under the radical. Now, the square root of t squared is not t unless we already know that t is strictly positive. Remember that the square root of a variable squared is the absolute value of it. Because the radical is already there, we have to force it to carry the same positive sign. However, in our case, recall from up here that t is in the interval between 0 and 3. 
which means that T is non-negative, which means I can drop the absolute values. Now I want to integrate. So I integrate from zero to three of T times the square root of 32 plus nine T squared DT. When I complete this, I can do a U substitution. So let's do our U substitution over here off to the side. So my U is going to be the radicand, the expression under the radical, which is 32 9 T squared. And the derivative of U becomes 18 T DT. I can solve for DT by dividing by 18 T to get DU over 18 T. Then I can substitute this back inside. And remember that we want to change the limits of integration as well. They were T values, now they need to be U values. So we can say, let me go ahead and start with, when T equals zero, U is gonna be 32 because you square the zero multiplied by nine plus 32, you still have 32. And when T equals three, this requires a little more work. I've got 32 plus nine times nine, which is 81, which would give me, well, what would that give me? Um, 81, so that would be 110. I'm getting 113, all right? So make sure that you get the same thing, 81. Yes, I'm getting 113. Okay, so when I'm done with this, I'm gonna substitute this back into my integral. So instead of T values, I now have U values that go from 32 replacing T equals zero to 113 replacing T equal three. I have the T from here still present. What was under the radical became U and my DT gets replaced with DU divided by 18 T. The T's will cancel so that the T will be gone. And then I can rewrite this as the integral from 32 to 113 of 1 18th times U to the 1 half power DU. Now U to the 1 half power, just apply the power rule. So we end up with 1 18th u to the 3 halves power times 2 thirds, which will reduce with our 1 18th and give us 1 over 27. And we need to evaluate this between 32 and 113. So when you're finished with this, you will have 1 over 27 times the quantity 113 to the 3 halves power minus 32 to the three halves power, which you could simplify them a little bit, but it's probably okay to leave it like this. And this turns out to be approximately 37.79 units long. And that means that the path that the particle is traveling from parameter t equals zero to t equals three is about 38 units long, okay? Let's now go ahead and take a look at example number two. In example two, we have a parameterized curve, a vector valued function, two sine t for the i hat component, five t for the j hat, two cosine of t for the k hat. And our parameter t varies between zero and pi. What we want to do is we want to find the arc length of the parameterized curve. If we were looking at this in the x, z plane, where we only had two sine t and two cosine t, it would be a circle of radius two. In the y component, when it's equal to five t, that represents a line. So we basically have a circle being pulled along a line along the y, which you can see right here, and I'll show you another view of it in a moment. So when we're looking at this one, we want to find the arc length, so we apply the same process we did before. Go ahead and pause the video, work it out, and then turn the video back on and we'll compare our results. Okay, so let's compare our answers. Again, we compute our prime of t, we get this expression, 
Then we find the magnitude of it by squaring each component and then adding them together and taking the square root. Uh, the derivative gives us two cosine of t in the first component, five for the second component, negative two sine t for the third component. When we square them, we get two terms that have a multiple of four attached. We can factor out the four to get cosine squared plus sine squared, which is the Pythagorean identity one. This gives us four plus 25 under the square root or the square root of 29. This one is very straightforward in order to integrate. We simply have the integral from zero to pi of the square root of 29 dt, which gives us square root of 29t. Oh, and I forgot to put over here the actual answer, which is not t, it would be pi, all right? So we would have square root of 29 pi. I guess I got carried away. Let's just erase that. Now I can do that. There we go. And that's our solution. Let's take a look at these two examples in Calc Plot 3D. So the first example that we did was this one here. So let's go back to the first example, which I thought I had it done here. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. That explains it. Okay, it's right here. So you can see the path is curving through three-dimensional space there. It's not a linear path. And the length of that path turned out to be about 38, right? So in order to graph the path, you graph it as a vector valued function, a space curve, and limit the parameter between what it goes between. Let's now take a look at the second example. This second example that we have, I believe is this one. Oh, I didn't graph it. Ooh, interesting. Okay, two sine t, five t, two cosine t. Let's go ahead and graph it. Nope, I did not graph it. So let's do it just for fun. All right, so I wanna take this off, select a space curve, and it was two cosine t, and the y was 5t, I believe, I'll double check, and the z was 2 sine of t. So let me add that in. So 2 sine parentheses around the t, right? And we were going between 0 and pi. So I need to change my parameter to go between 0 and to get pi, simply type pi hit enter to get it to execute. You can tell I don't, I don't have a lot of it here. I can't see much of it. So what I wanna do is zoom out a little bit to see if I can see more of it. And you can see you've got just that part of it right there, right? So it is in fact part of that circle being pulled along a line parallel to the Y axis. And that's the part of it that we have right there and the length of it is squared to 29 pi. All right, let's now talk about an arc length parameterization. This is rather a difficult idea, but it gets used quite a bit in physics. So we want to talk about how can we reparameterize the arc length. Instead of being in terms of the parameter t, we want to parameterize it in terms of a unit along the path which is the arc length itself. And we'll call that S, the path of the particle. So if we let the vector valued function R of T represent the position of a particle in space, then the arc length function will measure how far that particle travels over a particular interval of time. So the formulas for the distance traveled along the arc length as a function of time follows directly from the formula for the arc length. So distance traveled as a function of time but will be written as S of T, where S represents this length along the arc length of the path of the curve. Okay, that didn't sound very good. S represents the position of it along the path the curve takes. And the value of S of T starting at some finite value t equal to a and going to some unknown t value 
gives you the length traveled along the path up to that point. So this gives you a function for the arc length in terms of the parameter. So S is in terms of the parameter T. And S of T is now representing what we previously called L for arc length. Now, in this case, U is a dummy variable, right? Remember from the fundamental theorem of calculus that if you have the variable, the independent variable in the upper limit of integration, then you cannot use it inside of the integrand or the differential. You have to replace it with a dummy variable. Now, if we take this and we took the derivative of this function, it would again, since it's position, give us a velocity function. And the magnitude of it would give us the speed at any point in time. So remember that the derivative is still a vector value function, s prime of t, but the magnitude of it, s prime of t or r prime of t, is the speed at any particular point in time. We're going to assume that our vector valued function is smooth. And if that's the case, then the arc length is always increasing because the particle is traveling along some path. And we're measuring the distance traveled, which has to be getting larger. This means the speed will always be non-negative. It will always be greater than zero for all t values that are larger than a. As time progresses, the speed always stays positive. Again, we're using s of t simply to replace our arc length function, but we're integrating from a constant to the variable t on which the arc length depends using the fundamental theorem of calculus, part one. We can now reparameterize the function in a more convenient form. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna first find this arc length function, s of t, and then we're gonna use that to solve for t in terms of s. So we're gonna perform the integration and get some value, and we'll have s equal to a bunch of stuff with respect to t, and then we're gonna, if we can, solve for t in terms of s. Then we'll go back to the original vector valued function of t and replace t with t as a function of s, which gives us ultimately a vector valued function in terms of the arc length parameter s. And this is called an arc length parameterization of r of t, since the independent variable will now be this arc length measure and not the parameter t. Now let's go ahead and talk about why we might wanna do that. If we start our integral at zero and we let it go to t, then this represents the distance traveled over an interval of time from the first moment until some moment when we stop the clock. So the arc length parameterization also appears in our context for curvature, which we're gonna study later in this section. And it also comes up when we discuss line integrals. Line integrals are one of the major concepts of multivariable calculus. They come at the end of the course in chapter six. Let's now do an example so you can kind of understand the process of what we're doing. So in this case, we're looking at the arc length parameterization for a helix, which is given by three cosine of t, three sine of t, and four t. And t, of course, is gonna be greater than zero. We're thinking of this as the path an object takes where t is time. We want to use the relationship between arc length and the parameter t to find an arc length parameterization of r of t. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is we have to define our S of T. So we called it L previously, and it was a function of T, but now we're calling it S. And this is going to be equal to the integral from zero to T of the magnitude of r prime of some dummy variable u with respect to u, all right? 
So again, we're going from zero. This is set to be zero because it's given zero here and it goes to some arbitrary value. So if I said five, it would give me the distance traveled between zero and five, all right? So the next thing I need, of course, is to find the derivative of R prime. So I take the derivative with respect to T, which would give me negative three sine T, three cosine T, and four. And then I need to find the magnitude of it. So I square each derivative, add them together, and take the square root. Notice that when I square them, two of them end up with a common factor of nine. I can factor the nine off of the first two terms, and that will give me nine times the quantity sine squared plus cosine squared, which gives me one. And that tells me that I have nine plus 16, which gives me 25. And the square root of 25, the principal root is five. So I ended up with a five. So my L of T, which is now being called S of T, is not gonna be terribly difficult. The integrand turns out to be pretty straightforward. So my S of T is going to be the integral from zero to T of five du. Remember how to do the fundamental theorem of calculus, part one to part two. So we have five U evaluated between zero and T, which basically gives us five T. In other words, we now have a relationship between S and T. S is equal to five T, which means T is equal to one fifth S, okay? So let's add that relationship over here in gray. So T is equal to S divided by five, okay? So what would the arc length parameterization be? And I'm about out of room. So let me see if I can squeeze it in at the top of the next page. The arc length parameterization is going to come back to my original function here, r of t, and replace t with s over 5. So let me see if I can get that in. So r of t as a vector valued function was originally 3 cosine of t, 3 sine t, and 4t. And I am reparameterizing it in terms of S by replacing T with three cosine of S over five, three sine of S over five. And I'm sorry, but my S's and fives look very similar. And four fifths S, right? And that is the reparameterized equation. Now we also need to give the restrictions on it. The restrictions on the original vector valued function were that t varied from zero on. If t varies from zero on, then s will also vary from zero on. So s will be greater than or equal to zero. And this will be the solution to the previous one, which is this part right here. I guess I shouldn't have highlighted that one, okay? That's basically all we're doing in an arc length parameterization is just rewriting the vector valued function instead of as a function of the parameter T as a function of the unit of arc length that the curve follows as the object moves around in space. We now wanna switch gears and talk about curvature. Curvature is a relatively easy topic to grasp at first, but it can be challenging to calculate by hand. When we think about a curve, and you can see a curve right here, if I asked you, is it more curvy here 
and the flatter part of the ellipse, or is it more curvy on the endpoints of the major axis? You would say, well, it's more curvy on the endpoints of the major axis than it is on the endpoints of the minor axis, all right? When you have an ellipse, it's flatter at the endpoints of the minor axis and more curvy at the endpoints of the major axis. So we have less curvature where it becomes more linear and we have more curvature where it well curves, right? So curvature is a measure of how rapidly a smooth curve is turning. And we'll use circles as our representation for how fast a curve is turning. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to take the curvature of a circle and the curvature of a circle is constant. The curvature of a circle is given by the reciprocal of the radius. So if I have a circle of radius two, then the reciprocal of that would be one half. If the radius is four, then the reciprocal would be one four, all right? So if the radius is one half, meaning it's a very small circle, then its curvature is greater than a larger circle. And so the reciprocal of one fourth is four. So as the radius of the circle gets smaller and smaller, it becomes in a sense curvier. The curvature becomes greater. And we're gonna measure this by talking about what's called an osculating circle. When we look at an osculating circle, the osculating circle lies in the plane defined by the tangent and the normal, which we haven't defined yet. So hang on, we'll get there. Basically, it's a circle that lies along one of the planes associated with any point along the curve. And it is the circle that exactly fits the curvature of the space curve at that point in time. So you can see there are a couple of different ones here on this one, and I've given the curvature values down below. The curvature here is 0.82536, and over here is 0 0.64716. When the curvature is larger, the radius of the circle is actually smaller because it becomes more curvy. Let's take a look at this osculating circle out here on Calcplot 3D. Think, um, yes, I do have an osculating circle. There it is right there. Do you see how that circle is tracing along the path, getting larger and smaller? You can tell right here when it reaches, this is almost like a figure eight shape that's been bowed out in the middle, right? So it's like a figure eight that's doing a back bend or something. When it reaches a section of the curve where it's more linear, the circle gets much larger. And when the circle gets much larger, the curvature given up here in the upper left gets smaller. And when it reaches a point where there's more curvature, the circle gets smaller, so the radius gets smaller, so the reciprocal, which is the curvature, gets larger. And you can see it reaches sort of a maximum right about there. And you can come all the way around and you can see this osculating circle as it traces around the curve. The curvature at a particular point then is given by the radius, the reciprocal of the radius of the osculating circle that exactly fits the curve at that point. So let's take a look at the one below it. In the picture below, you can tell that on this minimum value here, the radius of the circle is larger than it is on the maximum off to the right. The radius of this circle that fits within the curve of the path, at that point, the radius is small, so the reciprocal will be larger. So the curvature here is greater than the curvature here where the circle is larger. We use the Greek letter kappa to represent curvature. 
So kappa is the Greek letter for K. Let's take a look at this curve right here in Calplot 3D and take a look at the osculating circle. So I've actually put it on here twice so that I could play with two different osculating circles. So it's actually listed twice. It may be if you're wondering why there are two of them, I've got two. So if I move this one, notice that it moves very, very rapidly. So you have to go very slowly to see it. Notice that when we reach this very linear section, this is still a circle. It's ginormous, right? It's so huge, you can't see it, right? So the radius of it is very large. So the reciprocal is very small, meaning there's not a lot of curvature here, right? However, if we take it back to where the maximum was, we can see that the radius of the circle gets smaller and smaller and reaches sort of a minimum right there at the maximum. And then if we continue on, you can see that on the linear parts, it gets larger again. And then it starts getting smaller as it approaches that minimum value there and then gets larger again. And again, I have it on here twice. So in case you're wondering why there are two circles, I wanted you to be able to see what it would look like in two different positions. So I can click in the other box and this will let me control the other one, right? Now, how do you get the osculating circle on there so that Calplot 3D will give you the curvature? What you do after you enter your space curve with your parameter limits, you click on the gear symbol and there is a button under the vector heading that says show osculating circle and show curvature value. And that's what you wanna click. And then you'll get to see them. Let's take a look now at the formal definition of curvature, which again is given by the Greek letter kappa. When we're looking at this, there are gonna be various forms. So there's going to be more than one. And we are uh, supposing that we have a smooth curve. So that means that the vector valued function is continuous over the interval and that its derivative is not the zero vector, right? We don't have any pointy parts. All right, so when we're looking at this smooth curve, either in the plane or three-dimensional space, given by either R of T or R of S, parameterized by the arc length, um, then we let uppercase T represent the unit tangent vector, not the tangent vector, that's R prime, the unit tangent vector. Then the curvature at T or at S, depending on which one you've written it in terms of, is the magnitude of the derivative of the unit tangent vector with respect to the arc length parameter. Yikes. That means that we would have to write the unit tangent vector not in terms of t, but in terms of s, which means that we would have to reparameterize the vector valued function with the arc length parameterization of it. And this is written also as the magnitude of T prime of S. Again, the uppercase letter T stands for unit tangent vector. All right. Now, unfortunately, that does mean rewriting that unit vector in terms of S. And that can be quite difficult. I have done it. I promise you it's not generally a fun thing to do since the vector valued function R is usually written in terms of the parameter T, then its derivative divided by its magnitude, which is the unit tangent vector, is also generally written in terms of T. So in this case, we can rewrite it. There are a couple of other formulas that will work instead to compute the curvature. These formulas do not require us to rewrite the equations in terms of S, the arc length parameter, instead of T, the regular parameter. The first one that you see right here, notice that we still have the magnitude of the unit tangent vector's derivative, but it is a function of T this time, not S. And it's divided by the magnitude of the derivative vector, all right? 
the derivative of r is, of course, the tangent vector. So we're taking the magnitude of the derivative of the unit tangent vector and dividing by the magnitude of the tangent vector. Now you may say, but the unit tangent vector is length one. Yes, it is, but that doesn't mean its derivative is length one, right? So you have to be careful. So this is one formula that's relatively straightforward to apply. It does involve quite a few square roots, but frankly, they all do, so you just have to use the square roots. For a smooth curve in three dimensions, it turns out that the curvature in three-dimensional space can be found by taking the magnitude of the cross product of the velocity vector valued function crossed with the acceleration vector valued function. R prime of T crossed with R double prime of T take the magnitude. And then you divide by the magnitude of the velocity vector valued function, which is the derivative of the vector valued function cubed, all right? I know you're like, oh my God, where'd these come from? It takes quite a bit of doing to derive the formulas, more time than we have allowed. So we're not gonna derive the formulas. You're just gonna have to take them on faith. Now, the third formula that you see here is applying in the plane. So this is applying to two dimensions. And notice that it does not have any vector notation being used here. It has instead a function f of x. So y equals f of x. We have to still have both the first and second derivative of y exist. So y prime must exist and y double prime must exist. Then we can find the curvature of this curve in the plane, which is gonna be a function of both X and Y, kappa will be the absolute value of the second derivative over one plus the square of the first derivative all raised to the three halves power. So under a square root and cubed, right? Now this formula applies to 2D and does not require it to be a vector valued function. It's just a regular old function, but this will give you a way of computing the curvature of the function at a particular point. I think it's time that we probably do some examples. So let's start with example four, find the curvature for this three component vector valued function in three dimensional space given by t comma three cosine t comma three sine t. Let's go ahead and see what our formulas are. So let's come back up here to our formal definition. We don't want to use the arc length parameterization unless we want to go through all the trouble of rewriting it. So instead we could use this one or we could use this one here, all right? For three dimensions, it makes sense that we could use, well, we can do either one. Um, it won't make a difference. We'll get the same result. I'm going to use this formula right here, I believe is the one that I used in my notes. So I'm going to copy this and I'm gonna paste it here into example four. Right. So the first thing I want to do is find the tangent vector. Now the tangent vector is R prime. So we're going to label these so we can be sure that we understand the tangent vector is R prime of T. And then I need to find the magnitude of it. And after I find the magnitude of it, I need to find the unit tangent vector. The unit tangent vector is going to be equal to R prime of T divided by the magnitude of R prime of T. It has to be one unit long, right? And this will force that to happen. I'm also then going to take the ratio 
of the magnitude of the derivative of this. So after I find this, I'll be able to compute the derivative and then I'll be able to find its magnitude. And then I can divide by the magnitude of our prime, which I've already computed as part of finding the unit tangent vector. So go ahead and pause the video, work it out as best you can. If you get stuck, go ahead and turn the video back on and we'll show you how to do it. So the first thing we compute is the tangent vector, our prime of t, which gives us one comma negative three sine t, negative three cosine t. Then we have find its magnitude by squaring each component, adding them together and taking the square root. This leads to the square root of 10. The next thing we want to do is compute the unit tangent vector, the unit vector that points in the direction of the tangent vector, r prime of t. We do this by taking r prime of t and dividing by the magnitude of it, which is the square root of 10. And we get components 1 over square root of 10, comma, negative 3 sine t over square root of 10, comma, negative three cosine t divided by square root 10. The next thing we want to do is find the magnitude of the derivative of the unit tangent vector. Yes, it's true that the magnitude of the unit tangent vector is one, but we don't know what the magnitude of the derivative of it would be. So first we compute the derivative, which gives us zero comma negative three divided by root 10 cosine t comma three divided by root 10 sine t. To find the magnitude, we again square each component, add them together and take the square root. This time we end up with the square root of nine tenths, which becomes three divided by the square root of 10. Finally, we have the two pieces we need to compute the curvature of this particular vector valued function. We take the magnitude of the derivative of the unit tangent vector, three divided by the square root of 10, and divide by the magnitude of the tangent vector, r prime. That was square root of 10, which gives us three divided by square root of 10 times itself, which is three divided by the square root of 100, which is three tenths. Note that we got a constant answer on this one, something that did not in fact depend on t, which must mean that on this particular vector valued function, the curvature is constant and never changes. Let's take a look at it in Calplot 3D. In calc plot 3D, you can see right here in the upper left, the curvature is 0.3 or 3 tenths. What we have is a circle being pulled along a line. And no matter where I go, the curvature and the osculating circle remains the same size and the same value. Let's now look at example five. Find the curvature of the plane curve defined by the function y equals 3x squared minus 2x plus 4 at the point where x equal 2. Now, y equal 3x squared minus 2x plus 4 is clearly an upward opening parabola. And we know that the curvature changes along it. The curvature will be the highest value near the vertex. Let's go ahead and use the formula that was given earlier for finding the curvature of a plane curve not given in terms of a vector valued function. So what we wanna do is the absolute value of the second derivative divided by one plus the first derivative squared all raised to the three halves power. To compute this, we need the first and second derivatives y prime is going to give me 6x minus 2. y double prime is going to give me 6. I want to find the curvature, so I'm going to plug these into the formula. The absolute value of the second derivative 
divided by the quantity one plus the first derivative squared, all raised to the three halves power. For some reason that six looks like 161. I'll make those longer. So this gives me a formula to find the curvature at any point on that curve. And specifically, we want to know what it is when k equals two. So to find what it is when k equals two, I need to substitute the value or x equals two, substitute the value x equals two. I can drop the absolute value on top, and this gives me one plus six times two minus two quantity squared raised to the three halves power. When I work this out, this is gonna give me six divided by six times two is 12 minus two is 10 plus one is 11. So I have 11 to the three halves power, which can also be written as six divided by the square root of 11 cubed, or you could do 11 cubed and then do the square root, right? Whichever way you prefer, right? And this turns out to be a very small curvature, which is about 0 0.0059. And then there are a bunch of ones after that, and it keeps going, right? This does not have a lot of curvature. It must be along one of the linear sections of the parabola. And let's take a look at that, right? So here it is right here. And I do have an osculating circle. I entered T equal two in the trace so that I could see exactly what the curvature was. And you can tell how, what 3D is rounding it off. And this black mark is the osculating circle whose radius is so large, we can't even really tell it's a circle. And again, if I were to take the animate slider bar, you can see the osculating circle coming in and getting very small near the vertex. That's where the curvature is the greatest, in this case, about 4.8. Let's now go ahead and move on. Oh, I left a lot of room for that one. Okay, I didn't need that much room. <laughs> okay, so now what I'm looking at is the normal and binormal vectors. This is the last part of this section that we wanna talk about. We've been talking about the unit tangent vector, which goes in the direction of the tangent vector, which is R prime, but is exactly one unit long. We now want to introduce two more unit vectors at the same point in space as the tangent vectors evaluated. The first one is the unit normal vector. Again, assuming we have a smooth curve where it's continuous and the derivative is not the zero vector over an open interval, then we want to make sure that the principal unit normal vector is defined to be the derivative of the unit tangent vector divided by its magnitude. Dividing by its magnitude guarantees that it is one unit long, but the normal vector is t prime of t divided by the magnitude of t prime, where t is the unit tangent vector. Now, as you might expect from calculus one, the normal vector is a unit vector in the direction of the acceleration vector at a particular point. Because if we take the velocity vector, which is uh, r prime of t, um, and the unit vector that points in that direction is uppercase t of t, then if we take the derivative of it and divide by its magnitude, well, the derivative of velocity is acceleration. So the normal vector must be the unit vector pointing in the direction of the acceleration vector. And in fact, it is. What is the unit binormal vector? Well, the unit binormal vector if we have a smooth curve again, the binormal vector is the cross product of the unit tangent vector with the unit normal vector. And yes, the order does matter because you know if you do it the other way, you get a negative. 
So it's got to be unit tangent crossed with unit normal. And what it does is it creates a three-dimensional system at a particular point. So the binormal vector is always orthogonal to both the unit tangent vector and the normal vector and is a unit vector itself. This gives rise to what we call the Frenet frame of reference named for a mathematician. It's also called the TMB framework. And the TMB framework stands for unit tangent, unit normal, unit binormal. We often just call them tangent normal and binormal, but we do mean unit. So you're gonna have to make sure that you understand from the context, if they're talking about the unit tangent vector, uppercase T, or if they're talking about the tangent vector, R prime of T. When we talk about this one, let's take a look at one of the examples we did earlier. This is example four on the left. And we want to take a look at this framework at the point where T equals two. We found that the curvature on this one was constant. So the framework is right down here at the very bottom of the graph on the left. You'll see that there is a purple vector, a red vector, and a teal colored vector. The tangent vector is the violet or purple vector. The unit normal vector is the teal colored vector. That's the one that points in the direction of the acceleration vector. And the red vector is the binormal vector. We can also put planes onto these, and you can see that when we do that, we get a three-dimensional system where the tangent vector is orthogonal to the binormal vector, which is orthogonal to the normal vector. So we create a three-dimensional system, but instead of being at the origin, it's sighted right there at the point where the object is in space. Let's take a look at this now over here in CalcPlot 3D. Here is an example of what it looks like to have the TNB framework right here. The dot is the point at which it's evaluating the different ones. And I'm going to move it along in different locations. And you can see that they're pointing in different directions when we get to different locations. Notice that up here in the upper left, it's also giving us the vector equivalency for the unit tangent, unit normal, and unit binormal. And they are all unit vectors. So if you square the components, add them together, take the square root, you will get one for all three. Again, the red is the binormal, the violet purple is the tangent, and the teal color is the acceleration vector, which unit vector which is the normal vector. Now you may be wondering, how do we get that plane on there? How do we see the three planes? So let me show you how to add that. Click on the gear symbol. And there's a space in here between two horizontal bars that says show whole T and B frame. If you show the whole T and B frame, then you'll see this picture right here. What it's doing is giving you the three-dimensional space at that point. So it's as if that point becomes the origin of that particular coordinate system. There are three planes there. One of them is spanned by the tangent vector and the normal vector, and that's the plane in which the osculating circle lies. We also have a plane spanned by the binormal and the tangent vector, and another plane spanned by the binormal and the normal vector. Let's talk about what these planes are called. The unit normal and the binormal vector form a plane that is perpendicular to the curve at any point, and it's called the normal plane. It sort of makes sense. We've got the two normal vectors um, combined, sweeping out a plane. That's called the normal plane, all right? So we're using the B and the N. So the teal and the red forms this plane that you see sort of right here. It's kind of a lime green color, right? The plane determined by the unit tangent vector and the normal vector 
This would be the unit vector pointing the direction of velocity and the unit vector pointing the direction of acceleration is called the osculating plane because that's where the osculating circle lies. So this one is the plane between the T and the N, between the purple violet and the teal colored vector. And it's sort of on the left hand side in that image. The plane determined by the unit tangent vector and the unit binormal vector is called the rectifying plane. So in the picture that we have up here, it's the one that's sort of forming the floor. So it's spanned by the violet colored vector and the red vector, the unit tangent and the binormal. You can, if you want, click on just one of the planes. You don't have to see all of it. You could take the osculating plane off and then put it back on so you can see where it is. You could show the rectifying plane or take that one off, spanned by T and B. And you could take the normal plane off, spanned by B and N. Okay. And I suppose the other thing I should show you is that this framework creates a three-dimensional system that moves along the curve to wherever that particular point is. So this allows us a way in physics of almost treating the point as if it's at the origin for everything we do, which as you can imagine, might be a whole lot simpler. All right. Let's now talk about the last example. So this is simply that menu that you see there. So let's do the last example where we want to find the unit normal and the binormal vectors for this vector valued function given by R of T equals cosine of 2T, sine of 2T, and three for the K hat component. The formulas are given for you right here again and repeated at the top of the next page because it will probably take you a little while to compute that one. And then remember that the binormal vector is the cross product of the unit tangent with the unit normal. Go ahead and pause the video, work them out, and then turn the video back on so we can compare our answers. So let's take a look. First, we compute the tangent vector r prime of t, which gives us negative 2 sine of 2t, 2 cosine of 2t, comma 0. Remember to apply the chain rule when taking the derivative when the argument to the trig function is not simply the variable. And we find the magnitude of the tangent vector by squaring each component and adding together. This gives us the square root of four, which is two. Now we need to compute the unit tangent vector, which is dividing the tangent vector by its magnitude. That gives us negative sine of two t comma cosine of two t comma zero. The next thing we wanna compute is the derivative of the unit tangent vector, which gives us negative two cosine of two t negative two sine of two t and zero, again, applying the chain rule to the unit tangent vector. Square each component, add them together, and we come up with the square root of four, which is again two. To compute the normal vector, take the derivative of the unit tangent vector and divide by its magnitude, which gives us the vector negative cosine of two t, comma, negative sine of 2t, comma, zero, which is in fact a unit vector. Next, we want to go ahead and compute the binormal vector, which is the cross product of the unit tangent vector with the unit normal vector. When I did this one, remember to expand, you have row one, i, j, k, and then row two becomes the unit tangent vector, and row three becomes the normal vector. I chose to expand along column three since it had two zeros in it. This means that I mark out row one and column three and multiply K, which is in the one three position, one plus three is four, which is even, so it's positive, by the two by two matrix. 
when I multiplied the main diagonal components together, I get sine squared of 2t. When I multiply the minor diagonal components together, I get negative cosine squared of 2t, but I subtract it, which makes it positive. This gives me a Pythagorean identity of 1, so it turns out that the binormal vector is just k hat itself, the vector 0, 0, 1. This concludes the video on the section dealing with arc length and curvature. In our next video, we'll take a closer look at actually looking at the motion in space of some object traveling on a three-dimensional path. I hope to see you for the next video.